All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco. Uh, I work at Paria as uh, one of the team leads for the AI team and also as a deep learning consultant. And in the past, I've been mostly working with uh, camera vision. So this talk is titled, Are Your Models Resistant to Adversarial Attacks? And it's structured somewhat like a story. And this story mimics my experiences investigating this field. So I'm going to take you along with this sort of journey that I had over the past six months. So let's start. Now let's say uh, you're tasked with building an image classifier, right? So if you're a machine learning engineer or deep learning engineer, and if you've done this a couple of times, the process is quite simple, right? We get the data. The data is coming from some distribution over the data. Uh, and this is the training data, right? So we, we have the input, x, which are images, uh, in my case, since I work a lot with vision. And we have the labels, right? The true label uh, corresponding with the input data. We construct the model. The model is parameterized with theta. Those are the weights that we want to find. The model has an image as its input. It produces an output. We push that through a softmax. So we get probabilities over the different classes that we're trying to identify. And then we have some method of selecting uh, the final class. Right? Usually it's argmax, the most likely class. And in order to train all of this, we have some type of cost function, j. And that cost function depends on the weights and the input. Right? So, so far, so good, right? nothing, nothing new. We train the model. We run it on a test set. We compute some more tests. If everything looks good, we deploy it. And if we're really proud of our model, we push it to the repo. We write a white paper. We publish the data set. We even publish some frozen weights, right? because GPU time is expensive. And not everyone ha has the money to afford all these fancy GPU clusters uh, that you can afford when you're working. Uh, so all good. And then you start checking the logs, right? You might even expose a public API. You host it on your web page. Anyone can upload images and classify them. And then you start looking at the logs, and you discover this, right? And you see that this is popping up quite frequently, right? Some people put in images, and you know that your model is good but they are misclassified. And you don't really know what's going on. And so you do some more research online, and you find some papers that start talking about this, adversarial attacks. So what has happened is someone has taken a clean input image, an image that usually, when passed through your model, is correctly classified. It's been tweaked with some noise. But this noise is carefully chosen and applied to the image so that it fools your classifier. And this is the modified example, right? And what's even more worrisome when, when you do this sort of investigation, you see that it's actually more, more confident afterwards, right? And this noise is so small that we can't perceive it with our eyes. But it's enough to fool the model. So what is going on here? So this is an adversarial attack they are conducted using adversarial examples. And this is a pretty good quote, which captures the phenomenon. Uh, adver adversarial examples. Malicious inputs modified to yield erroneous model outputs while ap uh, appearing unmodified to human observers. OK. So let's try and formalize this right with some math. So what is happening, we have our data distribution. We have images and labels, in this case. And what an attacker is trying to do is they're trying to tweak that input so that it minimizes the probability that you're going to select the correct class. And this objective can also be changed. So in the previous example, uh, the, sort of the purpose with the attack was uh, as long as it's not a panda. right? But you can change it so that you can target specific classes. So I want you to change this image of a panda and make it act or appear as a banana to the classifier. But then again, we don't want this to be uh, visible to human observers, because then you could quite quickly look at uh, images and see, well, this is just gibberish. So they're subject to some type of distance metric, which is here represented with D. So we, we want the distance between the modified example and the clean example to be as small as possible. Uh, and in practice, uh, distance metrics that are used are usually different types of norms. So first order norms, second order norms infinity norms. And just a heads up, uh, math is going to decrease over time of the presentation. So don't worry. 
Okay, so uh, then again, we're going to have some math now, so uh, be patient. So how do we generate adversarial examples? Now, there are different methods. New methods pop up all the time. And so if you're a researcher and you want to publish a paper, then you should try and come up with a new method to generate adversarial examples. And you're going to see later it's quite easy to come up with novel methods of generating these examples. But at its core, all of these methods require a gradient to be computed. And this gradient is computed with regards to the input image. So usually when we're training our models, we compute a gradient uh, with regards to the weights of the model, right? We want to know how can we tweak these weights to increase performance or decrease cost. What we're doing here instead is we're computing the gradient with respect to the input, right? So every single pixel, if you're dealing with images, that goes into the model. And we want to see, OK, how can we change these pixels to increase the cost? And these methods, they can either be single step, so you compute the gradient once and then try and formulate your attack, or they can be iterative, so you do this multiple times. And as I mentioned before, you can sort of tweak this formula so you can target a specific class for misclassification, or you can say that you're just allowed to change this small patch of the input image. And this is one of the most simplest and popular ways to generate uh, an attack. It's called the fast gradient sign method. And what you're essentially doing here is you have your input image. For every single pixel and for every single channel, you compute the gradient. And then you take the sign of the gradient. Okay, so is it positive? Then it becomes a 1. Is it negative? It becomes minus 1. And then you essentially use this to say, should I add epsilon to this pixel, or should I decrease epsilon from this pixel? So it's a really simple attack. And epsilon, in this case, is essentially how much budget can be used to corrupt the image. OK, so, so now when you hear this, your initial thought might be, well, OK, you know, that seems uh, troublesome, but ah, don't worry, I'll just keep my model hidden. Right? Good luck computing those gradients. Well, it's, it's not that simple. Uh, and the reason for this is because attacks transfer between models. Um, and so this, and it turns out it's even worse than that. It doesn't matter if the architecture is different or if your model is trained on disjoint data sets, they still tend to transfer. So as long as you have access to at least some part of the training data, you can train a model locally, formulate these adversarial examples, and then there's a high probability that they're going to transfer to the remote model where you don't have access to those gradients. And I should also point out that the purpose with adversarial attacks is not to fool the model all the time, but just to fool it enough times. Right? And that's sort of connected to that epsilon, how much you want to tweak it. And what's even more interesting is that when, when people are doing this in research, they see that when they fool these models, they often agree on the same misclassified class. So your local model might say, this panda has now become a gibbon. And the remote model, with a different architecture, different hyperparameters, uh, different training time, it also agrees that it's a gibbon. OK, so now you might say, well, I'll keep my model hidden, and I'll use a private data set. Right? I'll go out there, I'll collect my own data. I won't even write a single sentence about the data. I'll just publish my results and then keep everything hidden. Well, it appears that this doesn't work either that well. And the reason for that is it's enough to have access to only the labels of the remote model. And this is a really interesting paper that was published a while back, uh, Practical Black Box Attacks Against Machine Learning. And it's quite interesting what they do. They try and say, OK, well, what if we only have access to a, a remote system? We can put in images, and then we get labels back. Can we find a way to, to break the system? And so they divide this up into several steps. So the first step that they do is they collect a substitute training data set. And in their case, they were dealing with handwritten images. And so they could just take some random images of uh, digits. Or what they actually did was they wrote digits by themselves on paper and took images of these. So as long as you know the domain that the classifier is working in, so right, this is used uh, for classifying digits or traffic signs, uh, it's enough if you know that. So they collect some small training set. Uh, they build up a local model, a really simple model, uh, which also like, it needs to be roughly the same. So if you're dealing with classification, your local model also needs to be a classifier, 
preferably with the same number of classes in its output as the remote. Then what they do is they take this data that they've collected and they push it up to the remote API and they get back the labels. So now they have an input and output relationship and they pump this through their local model. So they train their local model not with the aim of having as good performance as the remote model. They just want to have a local model that has gradients that correlate with the remote model. And then they have a novel method of how they can actually tweak the data that they get to sort of try and make it adversarial. And they do this loop over and over again. So get some data, push it up, get labels, tweak it, push it up, get labels, tweak it over and over again. And the results are quite astonishing. So they try this against models hosted at Amazon and Google, and they're able to fool them uh, around 96 and 90% of the time. And they also do some other tests with uh, traffic signs, and they get similar results. And this is even more scary. It doesn't matter what type of model is being used remotely. So locally, they're still using a deep neural network because they want to have those gradients. But remotely, they tried with uh, nearest neighbor models, uh, random forests, models that don't have gradients, and this method still worked. So this is really, <laughs> this is really worrisome. Okay, well then you might say, I'll, I'll keep my model hidden, I'll use a private data set, and I will adversarially train my model, right? So you find all these papers with all these novel methods of how they generate adversarial examples, you generate those yourself, and then you train your model to sort of defend against them. As you might have guessed, that doesn't, that doesn't work as well. And the reason for that is uh, pretty much it's hard to account for all forms of attacks, um, for every defense that pops up. Just like a couple of weeks later, another attack pops up which sort of destroys that defense. And it turns out that a lot of these different defensive methods that were generated, they result in something that's called gradient masking. And what that means is the model that you're training, it uh, learns to sort of mask the gradient around the input data. So if you look at this image here, uh, well, if you look here, so by flattening out sort of the, 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 um, yeah, the model's decision curve, you can get some gradients that are non-informative. And a lot of these methods do, some, do something similar. But what's, what's, uh, what's troublesome with this is this works in a white box setting, right? So if you're training on your model locally, right, it might end up masking these gradients, but you still end up in the same problem as we mentioned before in that transfer, uh, attacks transfer between models. So if someone is training a model locally without defenses, they get a direction that's good enough to use to push those pixels, and then they can transfer their attacks and your model breaks. So there are methods to defend for white box attacks, but not black box attacks. And even in, in white box settings, there are issues with these types of defenses that I'm not going to go into in this talk. Okay, so now you might say, well, well, that, you know, that doesn't sound that, that good, but, I mean, if we look at this in practice, we're not going to have a clean API where we upload JPEGs or PNGs. We're going to take images with cameras, right? And if you're adding this small, small noise, uh, that's probably just going to sort of get distorted and disappear through all those camera transformations that we end up using. So that should be fine, right? That should be fine in practice. Well, no. Uh, and this is also a really popular area of research where researchers are having a lot of fun uh, essentially doing what's showed here in this image. So they take an image of a uh, washing machine, they add some noise to some of these images, they, this adversarially construct the noise, they print it on a piece of paper, and then they take images of these printed versions. And it turns out that adversarial attacks, they transfer in these cases too. So if you look at the two right, rightmost images, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, in this case it says that it's a safe, in this case it also says that it's a safe and a loudspeaker, right? But then you might say, well, ah, you know, they kind of took the image from above, right? It's, they didn't really stress it that much. In practice we, we, we have, like, we rotate the objects, they get skewed, different lighting conditions. And some researchers have found out that you can actually account for that when you're building these adversarial examples. So they can uh, create adversarial examples that are robust to rotation, different types of morphing, uh, and they can still break models. 
And then if we sort of, sort of flip the problem, okay, so if I'm out there to, to break these systems, who cares if it's even visible, right? Why does it have to be invisible? I could just make my life easy and create one of these patches, uh, which some people did recently. And so this patch, it's, we can readily see it, right, as humans, but if you really want to hurt someone, it's enough to put it up on a stop sign. And if you're lucky, you're going to fool some, some autonomous car that's out there being tested. And then who cares, right? They're never going to find out who you were. And, and what's even more troublesome with these patches that people have started to generate is that they're universal. So before, the, the noise that we generated, it was connected to the input. But these patches, they're universal. So you can create them, and then you can attach them to any surface out there. And what's interesting, and I know we had discussions about this at the office when I showed this image, a colleague of mine asked, okay, so here it says that it's a toaster, right? And you can see kind of toaster-like features. Why just not print an image of a toaster, right? And put it up everywhere around in the environment. And what's happening here is if you actually lift, look at the softmax, uh, if this was just an image of a toaster, you would expect to see toaster right somewhere around 0.5 and banana around 0.5. But the way this attack is generated is that they're, they're looking inside the network what features are triggered uh, to make a decision that this is a toaster. So this is like a super toaster. It soaks up all of that probability mass inside the classifier. And so when the network is going in and trying to classify this, this is everything it sees. It doesn't see the banana, because the banana doesn't trigger the activations enough. So what should you do, right? You were told that there would be some defenses. And before we get into this, it's important to talk about why do adversarial examples exist. And the reason is people don't know. This is, the, this is fairly new in some sense. This has always been there, but this structured way of looking at adversarial examples, this happened first in like 2012, 2013, especially with computer vision systems. And people don't know. There are a lot of theories. Uh, some theories are that neural network classifiers are too linear in various regions of space. And so if you think about it, neural networks are hard to optimize because they're really nonlinear when you look at the weights and the input. But if you look at the input and the output, it turns out they're quite linear, piecewise linear. And I'll show a quick image pretty soon. Then some theories are adversarial examples are off the data manifold or that this might be caused by large singular values of internal weight matrices, or this might be intrinsic to the high dimensional nature of the data manifold. But simply put, nobody knows. There are a lot of theories, but there's no consensus. And so researchers are pooling more and more uh, resources and effort in trying to solve this, because uh, this, is, this is becoming quite a big problem. So th just briefly uh, to talk about neural networks and, and how they're linear. Uh, with regards to input and output. This is a quite interesting image. So what you can see here is there's an input to this classifier, uh, digits 0 to 9. The input in this case is a 4. You can see it here in bold. It's the purple line. And so what you see here in the y-axis, these are the logits, the unnormalized uh, log probabilities that are pushed into the softmax later on. And here you can see how they look when we change epsilon on this image. And this attack is generated using the fast gradient sign method. And as you can see here in this region where we have zero epsilon or very small epsilon, it's kind of all linear, right? But then once we sort of escape the small bound, we can see that it's highly linear. So we can see that here if we go to the left, right, we have some signal strength on the four, but uh, the eight is dominating up here. And it's kind of similar to the right. And this, a lot of people like this explanation because it also explains why attacks transfer from one model to the other, and that is because of this linearity. Uh, it's enough to find the direction where you should push that image to cross the decision boundary, and then you're in this huge space where the image is misclassified. And when we look at defenses, there is promising research, because as I mentioned, for every attack there is a defense. And defenses can be divided into two different sort of fields. You have proactive defenses. And these defenses aim to make the models robust to these examples, so not be fooled. And then we have reactive defenses, where it's OK if the model gets fooled, but as long as it can flag. Right? It can say, ah, 
I, th I think I saw a toaster, but uh, it's, it's kind of iffy. I don't know why. And uh, what's even more interesting is, so at NIPS, uh, which I guess everyone is familiar here in this room, at NIPS they have a competition now uh, where people uh, compete around hacking each other's models in this way, black box attacks and white bo box attacks. And this paper, Ensemble Adversarial Training, Attacks and Defenses, uh, they won at NIPS 2017. Um, and I think they achieved like 95% uh, uh, like impervious to attacks in a black box setting. So there is stuff happening. And we can also see that, uh, especially when it comes to Bayesian networks, right, networks that can express uncertainty, uh, they also seem to have some promising um, indicators that they might work in the setting so that they can flag that they're uncertain about input. And so, so what should you do in practice, right? I haven't given you any definitive answers. And I won't give you a definitive answer now either, but I'll give you some sort of pointers as to what I think uh, would be good to keep in mind. So one is to think about potential attacks during design, development, and deployment. Uh, this is not as easy to just import some layer from TensorFlow, like uh, import robust to black box attacks, boom, push it out. You need to think about this from the beginning. How am I going to deploy my model? How are people going to access it? Uh, are they going to have access to the weights? So all these things should be put in consideration. Then stay up to date on the latest attacks and defenses. As I said previously, if you look at papers that are one year old, they might say, we have the best defense. It works great. And then just one month later, someone completely destroys it. Then it's also good to think about that good white box defenses are not the same as good black box defenses. Uh, so in some papers, uh, they most some papers only talk about the white box setting where you have access to those weights, and some papers only talk about the black box setting. So just keep in mind that even if, like in a white box setting, if you get great results, that doesn't mean that it's not uh, pervious to black box attacks. And then the fourth point is there is a library out there that's called Clever Hans, uh, and this library can be used to benchmark your models, generate attacks and see how they perform, and it's available in TensorFlow. So this is a really good starting off point if you want to test your models. Uh, and to sort of finish this off before we go into the question part, why is this a big issue? Well, if uh, there's been a lot of talk today about deep learning, right? Deep learning is, is giving us all of these incredible opportunities. We can process images, we can process text, we can process speech. And adversarial attacks, while I've focused on vision, since that is my domain, uh, they are popping up in uh, voice analysis as well, right? So um, speech to text, you can see some cases where they add some noise to the sound file, and the model doesn't know how to translate. So it's popping up in sort of all of these areas. And there's this famous quote uh, from uh, Andrei Karpathy, who I think is the director of AI at Tesla where he said neural networks uh, are not just another classifier, they represent the beginning of a fundamental shift in how we write software. They are software 2.0. And uh, it's up to you if you want to agree with this quote or not, but I think it's apparent that deep learning has given us all of these uh, cool capabilities where we can solve some problems that we thought were unsolvable before, but there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? Everything comes with a cost, and that's apparent in this case uh, in relation to these attacks. So all these methods seem to have these vulnerabilities that we need to be aware of. And it feels like we're headed into a similar space uh, with like IT security, right? Where we have uh, antivirus companies that are trying to block off these viruses and people start coming up with new viruses. So my takeaway is that if neural networks are software 2.0, we're gonna need testing and security 2.0. And we're all gonna need to help out with that. With that, I'm done.